archaeologists get into the game. And in 2009, Arlen Chase and his wife, Diane, um, finally hired out a plane that had a LIDAR in it. And it, they had been at, at, at the Caracol site in Belize for 20 years. And they had characterized like two square kilometers because it is dense jungle. You can see nothing. I don't know if you've ever done a jungle trek. I mean, it sounds really romantic. <laughs> you get in the jungle and it's like, there's nothing four feet that way. I can see nothing. And five feet that way. I can see nothing. It, there's just, it's Jeez. a lot of work to see anything. They fly over this thing with the LIDAR and they characterize in the span of like five or six or nine hours of flight. I think it was total a few different flights 10 or a hundred times the amount of uh terrain that had ever been characterized in the area and the chases at that point this is again 2009 um there had been a, a, some minor archaeological uses you had a, a stonehenge guest on some time back the brits yeah. had actually overflown stonehenge and found you can see the undulations of the land and people stuff that people make is usually linear, right? It's, it's a fixed shape. So they found all kinds of new hedgerows and former hedgerows near Stone, Stonehenge in, two, in the early 2000s. The technology wasn't really there yet. The chases had been arguing that Mesoamerican culture, so we're talking about the Maya and so forth, um, had was on a par with ancient Greece or ancient China, big, not little villages, but really big. And they thought mm -hmm. that, you know, they didn't, they didn't even have the wheel. They were using burrows and whatever, because it's so hilly. <laughs> You're basically going to roll to the bottom of the valley every time you push something with a wheel on it. They, they said, this has been terraced extensively, we think. And we think this was 150,000 people and not 5,000 people. And, and their colleagues were like, whatever, man, what? No, they've overfly this with LIDAR and they, they find, I don't know how many structures that they hadn't seen. Arlen Chase told me that there were things that were five feet away from him that they had characterized 10 years earlier that they didn't even know were there. And the whole thing had been ter uh, um, terraced, right? And there were, there were roads, essentially, elevated roads that were leading from place to place to place. And subsequent scans in, nearby in uh, Honduras and elsewhere um, have confirmed that this is an enormous civilization that had been extant there. And they did the same thing in Cambodia. They've done the same thing in Europe to some degree. But I think the Mesoamerican Man. story, as far as LIDAR's impact on a different field um, or on a, a field that you wouldn't think that lasers would be terribly involved with, right. was pivotal there. So it's it, the, like the, uh, the forest is just so overgrown, even when you're kind of right on it on the ground, you, can't, you don't even notice this stuff. Yeah, and if you think about it, um, that's a big part of it. But it's also just spec your perspective. You're you're right in the middle of it. It's really hard to get a sense, like a terraced field, um, especially because the terrace is it's been overgrown, so it's not it's not as easy to see anymore. And this is really difficult terrain to go through. So mm -hmm. it's the forest for the trees issue too, right? That's yeah. why you know is your manager always smarter than you are at work? No, but a lot of times you know you'll go say, hey, I've got this issue and. Um, they're just coming at the problem from a different angle. And so a lot of them be like, if you thought of this and you didn't think of it because you're so buried. And that's, I think, LIDAR with archaeology um, to no small degree was successful because it pulled it all back and said, this is what's here. Now, they still need to get on the ground and say, oh, wow, there's a new temple over here. We got to check that out. Right. Um, sure. And it's just kind of been, or yeah. exposing things. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's the sort of first pass. Mm -hmm. And then they can go in and do the actual field work that is still indispensable, right? Right, yeah. So how does that, is it, like, if it's such a dense, you know, covering, how does that work? They just have a certain, there's a certain wavelength that can get through leaves generally? No. Or? Very good question. Um, so what happens is there's so many pulses, right? Mm -hmm. They are, I mean, it's, you really can't conceive of, of two million or whatever pulses per second Per second, right? Yeah. So invariably, imagine just a crazy ass rainstorm, right, in the jungle. And yes, the it, it's not a perfect analogy because the photons don't break up and drip and whatever. But here and there, you're going to get a drop that manages to go straight through, right? And right. Hit the, okay. Hit, and that drop is millions and millions of photons, of which on a dark, on a on a muddy, whatever um forest floor dirt, uh, dirt or whatever biomass everywhere leaves not a lot of them are going to bounce back but it tells you how many photons are in there that some of them make it back so uh, the vast majority of those light packets are going to hit the canopy and come back and then 
every story on the way down. That's why the, the guys that do uh, forestry are interested in, in understanding uh, forests because it'll hit the branches all the way down and the signals get weaker and weaker. And then there's a really strong signal stronger than you'd expect from the ground level, because even in a dense forest, there are certain areas where the trees have been knocked down and they're shorter things. There's some scrub on the ground. Yeah, man, that's crazy. Um, but then just to jump back. So when they're kind of, if you, they're specifically looking for, you know, ancient type of ruins or cities and they get all that data, do, do they kind of have to clean it up to get rid of oh, all, yeah. all that stuff on top, all the trees and canopy and everything? Yes, they do. And that's, that's done. So there are software. So the, the LIDAR will just send you a blob of stuff, uh-huh. right? And, yeah. and so the temple below or the tank below the leaves will initially, if you were just, our eyes don't make sense of it anyway, first of all. But if they did, it would be indiscernible. But they know, because again, from our tennis ball against the garage door analogy, mm-hmm. if you, once you do it a few times, you have a sense of sort of where the door is, right? And so if you were to get, if you were to get a reading, let's say you're somebody walks by with a with a board, and the, the photon comes through the tennis ball comes back way too early, you'd be like, ah, oh, that's a little weird. Yeah. So they have software basically that says anything above this point or below this point. Just put it really simply, and they're really sophisticated algorithms. I mean, people with PhDs work on these things for like a career, um, but they'll just say, okay, let's filter that out. We don't want the stuff that's up here. We don't want the stuff down here. And then they can move it around a little bit and say oh, well, that's a really solid object versus something that seems like it's small. You can tell size, you can tell. So yeah, it, there's a ton of post-processing. And that's, a, that's been, a, it, and I would say today remains the biggest hurdle with LiDAR systems. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, it returns gobs of data. And for you to be able to process that, uh, you need to take that gob of data and turn it into something that is less of a gob of data or filter out the stuff you don't want. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. No, thank you for explaining that. Cause that, no, I was always I, confused of how that, how that would work. Cause it, yeah. I mean, kind of it, it light has to have a clear path that has to, cause it yeah. will bounce off of almost anything, I guess, except for, you know, water, or you can filter it through different things, I guess. But um, yeah, that was confusing to me. So thank you for that. No sweat. Um, let's talk about self-driving cars. Can we let's. get into that? Yes. Hey, thanks for watching this video. This is my dog, Murphy. And these are dog treats. Now I'll give Murphy one of these dog treats. And all you have to do is press the like button. Just press that little like button right down there at the bottom of this video. And this sweet, adorable, cute little puppy gets a treat. All thanks to you. Alright, you did it? Okay. I believe you. You said you did it. There you go, Murph. She got that treat because of you. Now, I'll eat one of these treats. And all you have to do is click that subscribe button right there, pointing to it. Just click that subscribe button, subscribe to curiosity with me, Travis DeRose. Get lots of good video, and I'll eat this treat. All right, you did that too? That's not very good, but I'm not very good.